our moderator. Today, you're, you're in for a great session. We have members from the ATR Standard Forms Purchase Contract Subcommittee to share some of the hot spots and information on the contract. Your moderator, as well as panelists, is Patrick O'Neill, Principal Broker Owner of Luxury Homes International and O'Neill Group LLC Commercial Services. Luxury Home International is located in Hawaii and Hong Kong and serves local, national, and international clientele with over 50 professional agents and staff. Please join me in welcoming Patrick O'Neill. Thank you, Arlene. Um, good to be here. Uh, thank you for the invite. And I'm here today as the co-vice chair of the Standard Forms Committee and the chairman of the Purchase Contract Revision Subcommittee. Um, before we begin, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed today are solely those of these speakers and do not necessarily represent the views of Rebbe or the Hawaii Association of Realtors. The information should not be considered legal advice. Please check with your principal broker and legal representative uh, for guidance. I um, want to say thank you to all the members of the Purchase Contract Subcommittee. We've been working on the contract for about a year and a half. Uh, all of these people contributed time, energy, brain juice, and it was a great group that was brought together. Their companies represented nearly 90% of all closed sales in 2022 across the state. Just a real pleasure um, to have a chance to work with these people. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also pay tribute to all the committees that have come before ours and the forefathers and mothers that have set up our real estate community the, the way that they have. So I want to thank everybody for that. Uh, during the process, we also reached out to various people, uh, lenders in town, uh, Title and Escrow, Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, Miles Eno and his staff. He's the executive director at the Hawaii Real Estate Commission, and Lynn Morrison at the Professional Standards for the Honolulu Board of Realtors. The most important part of this whole process and for all the forms that we do throughout the year is really you. Your comments, your suggestions are the most important uh, for us uh, to hear back uh, as practitioners out there in the world. For the purchase contract, we received 200 comments and suggestions, which were greatly appreciated. We went through everyone. We take them serious. Right now, the purchase contract uh, as proposed, is available for member comments through October 7th. Please take the time to go through it. It's such an important document for all of us. We look forward to your feedback, positive or negative, anything that you have to say. So uh, please share that with us. I think Chris is going to drop that into the chat uh, as a link. The four people joining me today, probably familiar faces to you, uh, Jason Corta, staff attorney at the Hawaii Association of Realtors, Chuck Garrett, principal broker at Corcoran Pacific, Laura Lewis, principal broker at Homes of Hawaii, formerly at Century 21, and Rhonda Lee Hay, broker in charge at Hawaii Life. And the way we've segmented this today, we're going to present in a couple of different segments with the panelists all available to jump in and comment at any moment. Uh, and then we'll go into the Q&A and by the way, thank you for everyone who sent in uh, the comments and the questions of what you'd like to see covered today. We will get to as much of that as we can uh, within the time allotted. So to start this whole thing off, uh, uh, please welcome Jason Corta. Jason's going to talk a little bit about the process, um, how we go through the Standard Forms Committee. Jason? Thanks, Patrick. So as Patrick mentioned, I'm Jason. As you can tell from the picture there in front of you, I have cut my hair and lost some weight since the uh, that photograph. So if you have any the, the video you see in front of me is how I look today. Um, Still handsome anyway. as ever, though, which is important. Oh, thank you, Patrick. You know. <laughs> um, all right. So quickly, I'm going to describe how HIR creates and revises standard forms, who I am, what the standard forms committee is, why the standard forms committee revises and creates new forms and how they do that. So first, as to me, uh, as Patrick mentioned, I am the staff attorney for Hawaii Realtors. I've been practicing for a little over 10 years, and I've been the staff attorney for Hawaii Realtors for, I think, a little over two. Uh, I'm the staff liaison to the Standard Forms Committee, which means I sit in on all their meetings. And um, 
that brings us to what the Stand and Forbes Committee is. Stand and Forbes Committee is the main way that the uh, association creates and revises standard forms. It's made up of members from all the local boards, or at least we try to do that. Uh, the current membership reflects, uh, what we, have. we have eight people from Maui, one person, sorry, eight people from Oahu, one person from Maui, two from Hawaii, and one from Kauai. It meets, it varies from year to year, but basically eight or nine times a year. It's already met seven times this year, actually it's already met eight times this year, and we'll meet one more time uh, latest this month. Um, so that's who they are. And why uh, the committee revises forms is the next topic. So that is, there are a few different reasons. One is to ensure that our standard forms reflect the current law. As you know, that's a moving target. So we often have to change standard forms to reflect changes in the law. For instance, most recently, um, we had to change the sellers for property disclosure statement because of a change in the law related to abandoned wells, um, as well as sea level rise. Um, but we also create or revise standard forms be to reflect new standards or practices within the industry. And I think a good recent example of that was the production and release of the new designated agency agreement. Um, the goal uh, in doing that is to offer new opportunities for members if they so desire to use them. And the last reason why they create and revise standard forms is basically to improve the flexibility and predictability of the forms. So as the form implies, we try to make sure that they are standardized, which means that you will have a way of predictably ascertaining what a particular provision in the standard forms would do uh, because they are written in the same way across all our various forms. And because, as I mentioned before, they reflected the current um, state of industry practice and the current law. All right. So now the process by which they do that. Um, <clears throat> it usually starts with the board of directors directing the committee to create or revise a form. It sometimes starts with the committee requesting and the board approving that a new form be created or revised. But either way, uh, once the board directs the committee to act, the committee then either forms a subcommittee to perform the task or assigns the um, task to an existing subcommittee. That subcommittee meets at least once, but usually a few times, and then proposes a draft for the full committee to, com to consider um, committee considers the draft. Once they agree on a draft to offer for a member comment, they do so and post it for a member comment for about a month. As Patrick mentioned, uh, we have a purchase contract, for instance, up right now for member comment. You have an opportunity to comment on the committee's proposed changes for about another two weeks or so. Um, once the comment period ends, the comments will be organized by subject matter and then presented to the committee at its next regular meeting. They'll discuss all the comments, make revisions as they see appropriate to reflect the comments, and then ultimately make a recommendation to the board of directors to release a uh, the, whatever form it is that they're working on. If the board of directors approves it, then sure. Yep, just about one minute left. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. If the board uh, approves the form, then it will be... Uh, released to the membership it has, um, through our vendors and through our intranet's um, website for uh, standard forms. And that is who I am, what the standard forms committee is, and how they revise the forms. So thank you, Jason. And, and if anyone has had the opportunity to work with Jason Corte, you know what an incredible asset he's been to uh, the Realtors Association. And Jason, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for thank all you, Patrick, that. Thank you, too. Do. Yeah, yeah, really, really enjoy it. Okay, our, uh, the next panelist uh, is going to be uh, a face you probably know. Um, he is the principal broker and president at Corcoran Pacific Properties, been in real estate for 30 plus years, managing offices and agents across the state. He's an active industry volunteer, currently the board president of HI Central MLS, and has been on our purchase contract subcommittee. Please welcome Chuck Garrett. Chuck, take it away. Good morning. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you to HER and Arlene and our Revy chapter. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to go here and go there. All right. And we have some wonderful transitions, thanks to Laura. 
Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I see so many wonderful names in the participant um, list and some 175 of you so far, I believe. So thanks for joining us. Um, we definitely wanted to talk to you this morning. I'm pleased that Disclosure and the uh, 508D are first up. It is definitely um, a hot topic, I think, regarding the purchase contract process. And particularly, um, it seems a large majority of the issues that we handle at uh, Corcoran Pacific are disclosure from the seller to the buyer uh, not being in order. Something, something wasn't disclosed. Or often I will say when there is any kind of issue that might involve mediation or an attorney, it's the disclosure statement they look at and they pick apart. And so we need to be more careful than ever, I would say. So I just wanted to review some of that. As you may know, uh, the disclosure statement is uh, about material facts. And so we'll talk about that in a second, but material facts within the knowledge of or control of the seller, observable, visible, accessible areas, and then those that are required. And so that material fact, sorry, so many transitions. Material fact is uh, related to a value, uh, uh, something that will measurably affect the value of the property. And so this also can be tricky because some of the things we, we know we must disclose may not necessarily affect the value of the property, but that is definitely uh, what the law is pointing us towards. As, as with many things, and as Patrick indicated, you're gonna to wanna to talk to your principal broker, broker in charge, broker policy, when it comes to some of these. Uh, re residential real property is defined as fee simple or leasehold, one to four dwelling units, residential condo or cooperative, whose primary use is residential. And so notice that vacant land not listed not required under 508D. Also not applicable is the sale to a co-owner, the sale to a spouse, parent, or child, uh, a court order, or operation of law, of which there are many examples, foreclosure, et cetera. Again, not required to have the 508D not apply. Finally, a sale of a lessor to lessee, the conversion from leasehold to fee simple, not required, uh, new residential property, condominiums um, accompanied by an unexpired developer's public report and timeshare, also exempt from 508D. It's important to note, while we separate the documentation requirements of 508D into M1 on the purchase contract, it is actually all part of 508D. So the disclosure of material facts related to recorded declaration and other recorded restrictions or conditions are part of 508D. So cannot be uh, removed from the contract. Some additional disclosure requirements uh, related to the sale. In other words, even if the transaction is exempt from 508D, we are still required to follow regular common law disclosure of material facts to prevent misleading representations. So the fact that it may be vacant land doesn't mean you have no disclosure requirements. It just means that 508D doesn't apply. So it's important to remember, you still would be disclosing any material facts uh, as you normally would. So one of the first questions, is a death on the property something that may be something that needs to be disclosed under 508D? I'll ask my panelists their thoughts on that question. Laura, you wanna jump in on that one? Sure. Um, I mean, we come across this all the time. And while it's not listed as being mandatory under 508D, use your best judgment because we know that um, a lot of buyers are gonna have an issue with it. So what I try and do is I always prep my clients, whether it's a seller or the buyer. I tell the sellers, if somebody asks me, if somebody passed away in the home, our best thing to do is gonna to be to disclose it. So I've never had a seller tell me that I couldn't, especially if it's something that's notorious, um, you know, violent, 
I had a listing one time, the seller, um, you know, got shot and killed in the home. Um, obviously that went off the market, but use your best judgment as a buyer's agent, ask your buyer, your, I mean, in your interview with them, you're going to ask them what's important to them. Maybe this is something that could be on your list because a lot of people, they don't care, but it's something good. Or to I, I'd say for our firm, 100%, there's a I death agree. or a notorious act. We will 100% disclose that. Uh, and and it's a good point. It's not required under 508D, which relates to the physical nature of the property. But I think all of us on on this call and on this webinar would agree. Rhonda, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, it's better to disclose it now than have them find out later and end up in a dispute over it. It's always yeah. our same as your Patrick, that yeah, you should absolutely disclose it just to be safe. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thanks everyone. And so that you'll see in a second, I'll show you, it's actually not required, but I think we're all suggesting it's a best practice. Again, you would check with your PB, but especially I guess in our culture here in Hawaii, um, it's quite common that we would share that information. And then the second is what about a notorious crime or even a haunting on the property? Does that need to be disclosed? Uh, similar question, uh, I think with a similar response. Um, I believe we're not going to, now the question is, does that affect the, is it a material fact? Does it affect the value of the home? I think we talked on the committee about what the judge say, can you please prove that the home was haunted, right? Whether or not that could be substantiated. But I think you kind of know when something, if the whole neighborhood or the history or headlines all affected a certain home, that that definitely needs to be disclosed. I mean, not by 508D, but just as a best practice, probably a risk Rhonda, management. Rhonda, how do you how do you uh, advise on this one? Um, again, I go just like Chuck says. It is definitely um, better to disclose it than have it come out later and end up with an, in a dispute over it. It's easier to disclose it up front, and especially if you know it's culturally sensitive with both this and the the death on the property. It's the same. Or you Disclose agree it, and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, if the seller says that every property they've ever lived in was haunted, you know. <laughs> well, they might buy it for that. Might be an advantage. All right, let's <laughs> right. move on, Chuck, because we're running out of time for this segment. Any any other uh, questions for yours? I think uh, that's it. I was just going to show this page, which does say that except, except as otherwise provided, this uh, active, uh, an occurrence that had no physical effect. Uh, may be excluded. But as we've just said, uh, best practice is to cover that. So that's it for me. Okay, excellent. And uh, okay, so our next uh, speaker or presenter, I guess, will be Laura Lewis. She's the principal broker of Homes of Hawaii Real Estate, licensed since 2003, served on several committees at the Honolulu Board of Realtors, currently on HAR Standard Forms Committee and the Purchase Contract Subcommittee. And Laura, your topic is going to be J1 and updated disclosures. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So I'll pull up my okay. slide. Let, let me know if you're All seeing right. the uh, correct version of it. Yep, just start from the beginning and you're good to go. All right. Are you seeing the right one? Yes. Yep, okay, we see very it. Good. okay. So like Patrick mentioned earlier, we did get a, a slew of questions from mm. everybody and very deeply appreciated. These were the general questions regarding J1. When does the contingency expire for buyers? And then a statement, J1 includes negotiation of repairs, remedies, credits. Does J1 relate to section I, J4, I3 and 4, I4A and B? So I'll generally cover all of these. I think everybody is really familiar with this section. If you're not, if you're newer to the profession, I highly advise that you read this section every single day. You know, this is normally going to happen within your first seven to maybe 14 days of acceptance. So you need to know this inside and out. At buyer's sole cost and expense, right? The buyer has a right to inspect the property or any portion of it. All the appliances, fixtures, plumbing, all the public records relating to the property and its use, all the matters concerning the property described in paragraph I-6. 
So everybody, as you're reading through each section of the purchase contract, when it references another paragraph, go back to that paragraph or go forward to it so that you understand the entire context of what you're reading. I mean, that, that's a huge tip, okay, guys? The obligation of the buyer to purchase the property is contingent on their approval of the inspections and everything within I-6, okay? There's a really big general and widespread mis misconception about J-1 because nowhere in J-1 does it say that the buyer has a right to ask for repairs. Nowhere in J-1 does it say that the seller needs to respond to the request from the buyer for repairs or credits under this paragraph, right? But what normally happens, I, I would say 95% of our transaction, the buyer submits the request for remedy and repair anyway. And then one step further, further over half of them come in on the day that J-1 expires, okay? So at the bottom of the paragraph, it states, if buyer fails to make an election in writing to terminate this purchase contract within the specified time, the buyer will have waived this contingency. So what happens if you don't hear back from the seller by the due date? Now your buyers are left with a decision and I'm hoping that everybody is prepping their buyers because you're submitting a, a repair request that the seller does not have to respond to, right? So seller hasn't responded. Your buyer has two choices. Do they cancel or do they waive their right to cancel and proceed to closing? If you haven't prepared your buyer, you are now creating a panic, right? Because what do they do? You have until 11.59 p.m. to make that decision. Your buyers have that right. So what if the agent says, and this happens all the time too, you know what? Don't worry, my sellers are gonna respond to dinner. They're, uh, I'm mean, sorry, respond to your request tomorrow morning. They're out to dinner right now. But they told me that they're gonna um, agree to the credits, okay? What the agent says is not what the clients are agreeing to. Everybody, okay? Unless you have it in writing, signed by the client, it is not an agreement between the parties. And again, check with your principal broker to see how binding it might be in their eyes, okay? This is and Laura, just I, I'll add something to that. It, it happens you. all the time. We all deal with that all the time. You can terminate the purchase contract that afternoon. Well, you told me they were going to haven't responded. You can rescind that termination the following day if suddenly they do come through and all the parties agree, which is another way to handle that. Correct, absolutely. And that's pretty much what we do, but you got to put it in writing. So you can say, you know, if the seller accepts the buyer's uh, request for remedy or repair, um, then this notice of cancellation is hereby withdrawn. Okay, however you want to do it, work with your broker. That's, you know, brokerage specific. That's how we would handle it. Okay, Rhonda, you jumped on, I think. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, just the, the one thing to be aware of what you do want to discuss with your client and your broker, because the seller does not have to let you resend that cancellation. So just know that there's there's pros and cons to playing that and just make sure all the, the clients fully aware of to pick the best strategy and definitely talk to your broker to help find that best strategy. Absolutely. Always refer to your broker. So in the spirit of cooperation, however, it is a policy in my brokerage to respond to all J-1 requests in writing anyway, even if we just say no, okay? Common courtesy, because the buyers are waiting. We all know that the buyers are stressing out. So just let them know um, with your broker's permission, of course. Okay, now we're on to a scenario. If J-1 is due 15 days after the acceptance date, and on the 14th day during, the ins during an inspection, the buyer discovers a large hole in the roof that the seller has not previously disclosed. How many days does the buyer have the right to cancel under J1? Under J1, you're on day 14. So I would suggest one day. If anybody on the panel disagrees, please let me know. 
would the right to ex would the right to counsel extend past the J one on the fifteenth day? What are your remedies? Well, and I would add to that the what overrules this is going to be the updated disclosure section, unless that's where you're heading next. That is where I'm heading next. Okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> got excited okay. there. Okay. <laughs> So the buyer's rights, J1 states clearly, the buyer's rights under this paragraph do not affect buyer's rights and timelines under section I. So again, read the content of your contingency. Start with I2. I2 says it's the amended disclosure. Seller is obligated to, pre to send you one, right? On later discovered information prior to closing if the seller becomes aware of information that they haven't previously disclosed, okay? And if that information directly, substantially, adversely affects the value of the property, okay? So we're not talking about a little broken handle on the jealousy windows or something. Seller shall provide an amended disclosure statement by watch what date, how many number of days you fill that in, how long is your closing, okay? Um, so within the seller's discovery of the non-disclosed issue. And what if the seller refuses to send you an amended disclosure, which they do, they often do, okay? Go to I-4, buyer's rights upon later discovered inaccurate information, right? If the, sell, if the disclosure or an amended disclosure fails to disclose a material fact or contains an inaccurate assertion that directly, substantially, and adversely affects the value of the property, I would suggest a hole in the roof does, right? And if buyer was not aware of that previously, then buyer can elect to rescind the purchase contract, cancel the purchase contract within the earlier to occur of either 15 days from the day the buyer found the hole in the roof, right? Or if the seller file sends you an amended disclosure statement, sorry, what did you put in I4B? Okay, so pay attention when you're doing this. And remember, any notice needs to be delivered to the other mm -hmm. party in writing. So one more question that was sent in, can you guys clarify which provisions of the contract is okay to respond with an email and which provisions re require a form response? In my opinion, if you respond in an email, that means the information is coming from you, not your client. Okay, We require it. Anything that has to do with the purchase contract, that it be in writing. J4, this is a fun one. If seller has failed to maintain the property, right? You go into the walkthrough, it's not repaired or whatever. Um, J4 says the parties agree that 150% of the estimated cost will be withheld and collected from seller. Um, in my experience over 20 years, I have yet to meet or come across an escrow company that will automatically withhold any funds from the seller without the seller's written permission. So if the seller doesn't allow escrow to withhold these funds, you don't get them withheld, okay? So be careful how much you're going to be relying on this paragraph. And folks, that is the end. Okay, off to Rhonda. Let me stop. Okay, and I'll just, I just want to add one more thing in there, um, Laura, that you touched on J4. If someone deletes J1, you're going to lose your ability to deploy J3 and J4. Um, so it's something that we talk about quite often um, to not do that. Okay. Um, our next presenter, um, I think maybe many of you know her, Rhonda Lee Hay has been licensed since 1989. She's the managing broker and director of operations for Hawaii Life, former president of the Realtors Association of Maui. She was the Maui Realtor of the Year in 2000 and is currently on the Purchase Contract Subcommittee. And let me pull up my screen for you. Hold on one second. <laughs> There's Chuck's beautiful picture. Let's get past Laura as well. All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, and then Rhonda is going to talk about closing dates and extensions. Okay, Rhonda, and you asked this to be on the screen. There you go. 
Yes, I'm not, I'm not as fancy with the slideshows as, as Laura is. Um, so the closing date is pretty, should be pretty straightforward, but unfortunately um, we get a little crafty sometimes by the first thing I wanna say about the F2 is if you had the honor before, it's really difficult to say the or before because who gets to choose that date? So that should always be a hard date or number of days um, because if the buyer wants to close earlier, the seller doesn't, like who gets to choose that deadline? So that's the first thing that starts with the closing date is deciding, you know, is it a certain date or is it 45 days after acceptance? Um, and then you become like, okay, what's after acceptance mean? And the, the contract clearly states how to count days, but to be clear about it, it's if today's acceptance date, day one is tomorrow. So that's another confusing little issue about the closing date. Um, once you have that closing date established, then the next thing is, is it a Saturday if it's 45 days after closing or 40 days? Is it a Saturday, Sunday, a holiday? Um, the contract specifically says in there, if the closing date falls on a date, the bureau is closed, closing will be on the following. The, the closing will be on the next day when documents can be recorded. So that means your actual your your scheduled closing date does not change but the date the recording happens does so the confusion comes in where people are like well my saturday 45 days turned into tuesday from a holiday weekend so if i have to extend for seven days under f3 now i'm on the following tuesday and when in actuality it's it goes from your original scheduled closing date because it calls scheduled closing date it doesn't say the closing date moves, it says the closing will. So that's been a little issue of confusion among people with what that looks like. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and the other thing, when you use that unilateral right to extend under F3, the actual form says, that says not no more than blank days um, by delivery to the other notice to the other party prior to closing. When you execute that form, the standard form says that the buy or the client executing that extension has the right to close earlier. So if you execute it for seven days and you're ready to close in four, according to the form, the buyer can say, I want to close on day four instead of day seven. Um, however, F3 doesn't allow, uh, doesn't do that. So there's a little, that could actually be subject to people going back and forth. So just make sure that you're really clear of the intent um, until we get those forms straightened out. <laughs> the so then the scheduled closing date, when it goes, um, the unilateral right to extend because it's only one signed by one buyer, by one side of the part of the transaction. So that creates a little bit of confusion. Someone's like, yeah, you ex executed 15 days, but I only need five. So there are a number of little nuances with the closing date that also the, um, if you execute, if one party executes like the extensions for seven days, but if the seller executes an extension for two days using F2A or F3A, um, then the buyer doesn't have the right to use the rest of that close that extension. So just be aware of that when people are, um, <clears throat> if people are going, if you've got a buyer lock, a loan lock or something, just make sure that your loan lock is expired after your full extension time. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes about the, So the, yeah, so the closing, like I said, it should be pretty straightforward, but there are those little nuances of the extension versus um, how long you have to extend. And if your extension is, um, if you use F3A and then you need more extension, then it's going to take both parties to, uh, you know, agree to that extension. So um, just keep that in, in mind. Patrick, did I leave something out? I feel like I left something out of this. Uh, no, but I'll just I'll point out to everyone that's that's looking, and I, I think everyone gets this. If you look at F1, this defines the word closing. Uh, and then F2 is the scheduled closing date. And this is where all the confusion comes in on the extensions. Defining the word closing date is a different definition from scheduled closing date. And the extension form uses the term scheduled closing date. Now, good news for everybody who's watching this, in the proposed new draft, we have eliminated these two different words. There's no need for them to both be in the purchase contract. It is going to be closing date, uh, or at least it will be if the, the current form is uh, is accepted. Laura, did you have anything else you wanted to add or check? 
I was just going to say for sure. So I think Rhonda said, when we look at F2, we want to see shall be a specific date, like March 1st, or 45 days from closing or something of that nature. Those are the two recommended options. So none of this honored before or sooner mm -hmm. uh, just adds confusion. Yeah, right. we're going to talk a little yeah. bit more about that. Because who gets to mm -hmm. choose that or sooner? <laughs> right. And then I think what I had learned from Patrick earlier in discussions was, and I hadn't thought about it because it hadn't happened to me, but if you're the buyer says 45 days or sooner, and then they're ready to close in 28 days, but your seller's not ready, what recourse do you have? Because the seller already agreed to or sooner, right? I, I think Chuck just had that issue as well, and it becomes hot. It becomes contentious. So Yeah, you know, when the lender I, says, we're, we're yeah. ready, and, and they tell escrow, and it's like, well, you haven't even talked to the seller. Yeah. Right. Problematic okay. for sure. Anything right. else to add on this yeah, section? That's definitely a big issue. I just wanted to add one more thing, Patrick, and I'm not sure if you're going to touch on it. Um, that was fabulous, Rhonda. Um, regarding the proposed contract, um, again, like uh, Jason said earlier, please review it. And we read every single comment that comes in, every single one. So they're yeah. all important to us. Yes, please, please get in there. Look at that. And having 10,000 pairs of eyes is better than having uh, the committees. OK, well, Rhonda, thank you yeah, very much definitely. for that. Uh, appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the takeaway there is the schedule closing date versus closing date, which has been an issue. Uh, OK, so I'm kind and of the, the and the fact that I did not use or before. <laughs> no on or before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll talk about that again. So. I'm going to be kind of the cleanup hitter here, and I'm just hitting various topics that were presented in your uh, pre-event survey. So some of them will go quick, some will take some time, and then we'll hit some Q&A. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Other hot topics. Why are some words capitalized in the purchase contract? Well, these are defined words. Uh, we just took a look at those the examples, acceptance date, closing date. When it's a defined word, if it's used anywhere else in the purchase contract or in the preparation of your addenda, please be sure to use that capitalized version, uh, signifying it's a defined word. What's the difference between receipt and delivery? This is a good one. I had a lot of questions on this. In general, purposes of the purchase contract, they mean the same thing. Confusion sets in because the statutes are written imperfectly. And in one sentence, they may use these two terms interchangeably. So as we're preparing purchase contracts, sometimes you will read it and say, why do they write it this way? We're taking the language right out of the statute. But for the most part, delivery is receipt. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Is delivery to the agent the same as delivery to the client? And the answer is, bing, yes. The agent equals the client. Um, this I don't know why this is confusing, but the agent is the client. If you deliver something to the agent, it's considered delivered to the client. What's the difference between addendum and amendment? I'm sure everyone can answer this, but I'll give you a simplified way to look at it. An addendum is a document that attaches to the purchase contract before acceptance. An amendment is something that attaches after acceptance. I have to give credit to Jason Corta for those definitions, but this is a simple way to remember it. So the amendment is after acceptance. Okay, C2, additional deposits. Let's take a look at this. This is something that you see in quite a few purchase contracts. The additional deposit is due three days after J1 acceptance. Can you pick out what is wrong in that sentence? Well, there is no acceptance of J1, as I'm sure you know. It only has an expiration. So a better way to write this would be three days after J1 expiration, or even tied to the acceptance date might be better. But do not use the words J1 acceptance, approval, removal. Laura, did you have something to add? You're muted. You're yes, muted. Yes, sorry, I do. One more thing to add to this is three days after three business days. I'm sorry, 
three business days after expiration. Because if it's a three day yeah. weekend, you're messed up. Good point. Good point. Very good point. But main thing is there is no acceptance. There's no approval. There's no removal of J1. Okay. Well, I think we talked about this, but it's worth looking at it again. Why is or sooner on or before within not advised for F2 closing? This is something that we see common 45 days from acceptance or sooner. Absolutely do not want to do that. Um, as it touched on earlier, it creates this ambigu ambiguity and it's unclear who can make that decision. So the suggestion is to use 45 days after acceptance date or even better to use an actual date. Okay, H4, um, this came in on several of the comments and there's misunderstanding here. So I just wanna touch on it. H4 requires a conditional loan approval letter with two components on that letter. Do you know what they are? Underwriter approval and approval of the appraisal. The way the purchase contract is currently written, this has to be on the same conditional loan commitment letter most lenders or many lenders, as you know, don't put that together. So it's created some confusion uh, and it's created some, some areas of conflict. I will share with you under the new proposed language, one of the things we've done is we've separated out these two components and they can be delivered separately or together. This is in the proposed draft language. So take a look at that at your time. And while I had this on the screen, I thought I would just share one other thing we've added to the H4 section. You can now just check a box to say that the prequalification is attached with the purchase contracts. So I hope you'll find that convenient. Good old M1. All right. So a lot of confusion. Actually had a lot of comments and uh, suggestions, again, from your pre-event poll. Let's take a look. Does M1 apply to single family homes? Does M1 apply to properties that do not have a declaration? Can M1 be deleted in the purchase contract? The answer is M1 applies to all residential properties, including single family homes and properties with no declaration or HOA. Now, can it be deleted from the purchase contract? We see this all the time. The duties cannot be eliminated. So although you might physically delete it from the purchase contract, no one could stop you, the duties remain. So highly suggested that this is never deleted. And if we look at M1, you can see in here, we don't have to go through all this, but I think the agents generally stop at M1 where they see subject to a recorded declaration. If you go down into B and you look at all of those with one last sentence on there, any encumbrances that will remain on title after closing, well, that pretty much relates to every property. And this, again, is language right from 508D. It's not something that we create. So it needs to be in there. Um, do not delete M1. Okay, this came in. Interestingly enough, we had this conversation last week. Uh, N1 and N2. What if part of the property, let's say uh, the front house is going to be empty, but a secondary dwelling is rented to a tenant? What should I select? N1 or N2 or both? And the answer is to select N2. And you can clarify in special terms whether the property is going to be vacant. Why? Because N1 says it will be vacant and free of tenants and all leases. So certainly that could not happen if the property had a tenant in any of the structures or even in, in any of the rooms. Okay. Hey, Section K, there's a couple of questions on this. Uh, I, we're aware of some of the issues in here um, in K3 and some of the other problems. In the new revision, it's all being addressed. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this right now. Uh, but just know that Section K has been revamped and you can see that in the proposed language. And I just left this on. This does not have to do with purchase contract, but it's a question that came in from several people on the pre event poll. When the buyer signs the seller's real property disclosure statement, does it mean that they have accepted the SRPDS? And of course, you all know the answer is no. Uh, the signing is just to provide notice of receipt as required under 
508D, uh, a mistake that seems to be made quite often. Okay, do you want to add something, Laura? Um, I just I just to mention that again, if referring back to the contract, there is no acceptance of the seller's real property disclosure. Good point. That's right. a very good point. Yep. Rhonda, do you want to add something? Rhonda, the other yeah, misconception yeah. about the the other misconception about the disclosure is that um, no matter what the buyer signs, he has that entire time that's allowed in the contract. So if the contract says you have 10 days for disclosure, he has those full days to cancel based on anything that was disclosed, no matter what he signs. Good point. Okay. And Chuck, can you come back on? Um, and I'm going to hit some Q&A right now, and uh, we'll see where this goes. I'm going to summarize the things that are in the chat box and what's coming in right now. Okay, we'll start with this one. I think this was answered, but does M1 apply to vacant land or to commercial properties? Well, so as we saw during the first part that I covered, M1 is part of 508D. So it's anything that 508D applies to, which is not vacant land and not commercial property. So, uh, you know, mindful that we still have to honor our, our uh, uh, requirement to disclose material facts, but yeah, not under 508D. And then I, can I, I'll jump in and add something sure. too, because if the vacant land has infrastructure, already built into it, right? It's got the plumbing, the electrical, everything's like ready to go. Um, would you disclose the condition of the plumbing and the electrical? I would, better safe than sorry. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, the other thing I am oh. is it will apply to vacant land if it's in a subdivision or any kind of has a declaration because that it, it covers that as well as 508D. All right, a couple of questions regarding um, the death disclosure. Uh, should it be voluntarily disclosed or is it something that should be disclosed only if someone asks? Anyone? So I think it should be volunteer. <clears throat> yeah, you have that conversation with your client up front and you're gonna definitely volunteer. Yeah. Okay, so not something to wait till someone asks you if it's if it's part of it. Let's put that in the disclosure. I, I think if somebody naturally passed in the house, you know, I, I I tell my clients, anybody who's looking on the windward side, these homes are forty to a hundred years old. It's highly likely that someone passed away in the home. Do you have? Would you have an objection to that? Do you want me to inquire if it's just a, you know, everybody's kind of doing that nowadays, so. Okay, and this is a related question. I think this is a, a, a short answer. Uh, if, if 508 does not require death to be disclosed, can someone litigate under 508D? I think the answer is not under 508D, but just under common law. Would you all agree to that? Agree. Okay, uh, and there's a comment in here. Why not make a response to J1 repair request mandatory in the purchase contract? Anyone? What was that question again? Why not make J1 well, can you read response? So if I'm a buyer and I uh, submitted a rep repair request to make it mandatory that the seller respond back to me with the next amount of time. Because the seller's not even, it's not even, the buyer's not even given the right to request repairs through that J1. J1 right. says they can do due diligence, but it doesn't say that. So that's why the seller shouldn't be required to respond. I mean, right. they should respond we, out of professional courtesy, but. Well, we've seen purchase contracts come in where people are putting special terms uh, into queue, requiring a response. I'll answer from my perspective. We always delete that out because when does it stop? When does it end? And, you know, if you're negotiating, when does it stop? When does it end? It can become kind of a circle. Anything else you want to add, Laura? No, I just, um, I tend to prefer that, I mean, the buyers are going to request whatever they're going to request, and I would just ask that the sellers respond. That's all. Okay. Jason, are you still uh, are you still on? Because this is a question that deals with uh, delivery and receipt. If uh, Jason's here, if he's not, I think we can handle this one. Jason, are you there? 
I'm here. Yes, Patrick. Oh, good. Okay. Go so video, in regards to uh, delivery and receipt, uh, you've, you've mentioned before, I guess, the mailbox or posting rule. Can you explain that, what that is, and how that applies to delivery and receipt? Uh, it's been a little while since I've looked at that. Um, <laughs> I can confirm what you said earlier, which is that I think a lot of the confusion regarding delivery and receipt arises from the fact that um, 508D is sort of poorly drafted. It uses both terms interchangeably or intervariably um, for the same purpose. Traditionally, something um, there is something called the mailbox rule, to which you're referring to now, um, which applies to documents sent through snail mail, basically. And depending on the circumstances, to uh, documents sent electronically as well. And it, def it defines when a document is received. Um, I'll just mm -hmm. confirm my understanding, but come back so to me in like a second. So it's like mailing just... to the IRS by the 15th. That's considered delivery, right? It's in the mailbox, it's delivered. Right. Okay. What? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So no. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's. Oh, smart. It's when it's sent is when it's yes. received as well. It's sent. Correct. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's so, the gist. It's a little more complicated, but that's the gist. Yeah. That's the gist of it, and you yeah. know, a good a good demonstration of that is the uh, acceptance of a purchase contract. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't touch on that right. earlier, but the acceptance, uh, when is the acceptance date? Is that when the client signs it or is that when it is delivered? And the answer is it's when it's delivered and right. it's not received on that as well. Okay, um, just ask the panel, this is not really purchase contract, but how do you approach it when a buyer will not sign the seller's disclosures? Hmm. We just had this yesterday, Patrick. And so, um, you know, uh, we just document the seller's response. And in this case, I'm not sure there was an attorney involved with the seller, with the, I'm sorry, the seller not signed. Did you say seller not signed? Uh, the buyer, buyer won't signed. sign. Yeah, yeah, the buyer won't So sign. for some reason, the buyer in this scenario is working with an attorney who reported back to us, we're not required to sign this, that, and the other. And so, um, you know, all we could do is document that for, uh, you know, future risk management. I can't compel someone to take an action. Yep, yep. And, and also on the other side of that, what happens if the seller will not provide one? Well, the buyer has the ability to terminate under default. Would you all agree to that? Yes. Yes. Okay. And they can still move forward and also come back to the seller after the fact. And that's what we tell the sellers. If they, don't, if they don't want to do a disclosure, it's like, well, if you don't disclose, it doesn't mean that it was waived. It means that they can close, they find something out and they sue you. Right. I, I think if either party is just is refusing to sign that I would ask, ask the agent um, to please send me an email with something in writing saying that their client's not going to sign, because that will go a long way to proving that it wasn't just an oversight. Right. We, right. we should say too, Patrick, and there was a question in the chat that what happens when you know something that the seller doesn't want you to say, or in this case, if they refuse to complete a disclosure statement, doesn't take us, doesn't remove our obligation to disclose material facts um, to, to the extent we know them. So we certainly That's still right. have our obligation. Yes, I think this was answered earlier, but uh, regarding J1 inspection, uh, if there are items that are found that are not on the disclosure statement, wouldn't this trigger the later discovered information clause in uh, seller's disclosure? And the answer to that is yes. So that, that, that's what gives you that longer date, potentially even beyond J1. Uh, hey, Patrick? Okay. Yes. Um, I, in the disclosure field, so can you touch on a little bit about the, the obligation of us as agents with disclosing items when we're involved in an REO transaction? Because they're um, exempt from 508D. <laughs> Yeah, why don't we leave that for a disclosure seminar, um, and we'll we'll kind of okay. we'll stick more to the <laughs> purchase contract right now because certainly this could go on for a while. Okay, um, can you delete J four? And we've seen sellers do that. Can you delete J four? Or what's your advice on deletion of J four? In my opinion, you can't enforce it. Mm hmm. Well, if you're a seller, in my opinion, it's a benefit to you, sort of. Um, 
if the buyer moves forward and you've done your obligation with your 150%, they wouldn't have the ability to terminate under that, perhaps under updated disclosure, depending on the issue. But if it was something small, then I think that helps cover the seller. What do you think of that? I agree. And I'm going to backtrack on my word that you can't okay. enforce it because that's a legal term. I've just never been able to get escrow to withhold. No, it's, yeah, it, they will require both parties to sign on that. Yeah, that, that's always been an issue. Um, uh, does K3... Fans are not in agreement. Go ahead. Sorry, one more thing on that, G4. If, if the parties are not in agreement, escrow will not record. Some some right. agents don't understand that. Just figure, you know, we just and so um, it's not really covered in there. But that's escrow stance on it. They just won't record until everybody's in agreement. Yeah, and we've had multiple conversations with the escrow company. And there's just no way for them to do that. Um, okay, does K three apply even if K one and K two are not selected? This goes back to the survey. K three, which is the boundary encroachments. Yes, because you can yes. when, if you, on visual inspection, you can see some encroachment. Mm -hmm. Chuck, you could also have where the neighbor has a survey. Okay. Yeah, for and sure. And then what's the purpose of the termination provision O3 versus just using O2 um, for all terminations and just for people that don't have all this memorized? Uh, O2, you have to terminate on or before uh, that expiration date. O3 gives you a couple extra days. Um, Chuck, do you want to take that one? No. <laughs> so it does, I'll it, take it, it, but I'll if take O3, it. yeah, if O3 is the termination provision designated by say in section Q, and I see it all the time, people add special provisions to section Q but then they don't state which termination provision is going to apply. Yes. So if you state it's three, then you have X amount of days after the expiration of the deadline. So I see people put in there seven days, 10 days. That That's a long time. Yeah. Seven days is left well, here's, but, but here's why we do it. Because... O2 is you have to do it within the time frame. So J1, the buyer has 14 days. J14, it's done. So there's no, so if they're going to terminate based on that, they have to do it within that 14 days. O3, however, let's say the buyer is supposed to give you final loan approval. The seller is the benefiting party. So he doesn't know until that time comes that the buyer failed to perform. So that seven days gives the seller the control or the benefiting party the control because let's say the lender says, I'll give it to you tomorrow or you know, on a Friday, so I'll have it on Monday. Um, if you only have two days to cancel on that O3, then you have to cancel by Sunday. So you don't have any room for negotiation. The benefiting party can still cancel on day two. It doesn't extend the contingency, but it gives the party that's the benefiting party the time to try to work it out before they lose the right to cancel based on that failure to perform. Right. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, especially with the with the the financing provisions, um, so that the seller does have yeah. time to to understand that. And then just the point is made, but if it's an O2 termination provision, it has to be on or before that date. It cannot go past. See that happen quite often where agents are letting the dates go by in H4 because the lender keeps saying, just tomorrow, I'll have it tomorrow, I'll have it tomorrow. And they miss that ability to terminate. It can get pretty ugly. Um, okay, one last one. We're kind of out of time. Uh, regarding C2, which is where we put in all the information about the uh, purchase price and the, the cash and the debt, uh, the use of is prevailing rates and terms acceptable to buyer. Is that something that is okay to be putting into C2 for the financing section? Do you have any thoughts on that? We counter it out. You counter it out. And, and why do you do that? We counter it out if we're representing the seller because... Because the buyer could walk into the table and say, well, I don't like the 3% interest you just offered me. It, it says acceptable to buyer. So the buyer is then put into pretty much until closing, he can say no, no matter what they offer him. That's right. Chuck, did you want to add something? Oh, we're the same for sure. Yeah. Same. And then what do you put in uh, if you're representing the buyer 
to give them some protection on interest rates, points, those sorts of things? Or do you put in anything under the financing? Anyone? Bueller? I don't normally. We don't, we don't put anything. Yeah. Yeah, we count so, on the uh, fact that if the, if the interest rates go up, they won't qualify anymore. So what do you put as you described it? Do you just say a new first mortgage or what? what is it? What is the language you put loan. in in C2? A new first mortgage, a new first conventional mortgage from a lender of buyer's choice. Chuck, what do we, you, we what do you like to see there? Mortgage. Yeah, ours would say the same, a new VA or a new conventional as large right. described. We always yeah. label. We, we don't of. put the we don't put the type of loan because sometimes we found that buyers that go in with an initial kind of loan may want to change their type. So we just put a new first mortgage at prevailing rates and terms from a lender or buyer's choice. We we've just been doing a uh, a new first mortgage, uh, just leaving it that nice and flexible. Um, well, want to thank all the panelists today and Rebby and Arlene for inviting us today. Obviously, there's a a lot more that we could cover. But please uh, take the time to review the purchase contract uh, draft that's available. Give us your comments and questions. And I don't want to offer everybody up here, but sometimes you can reach out to us directly if, if there's a question or something that we might be able to help with. But your input is so important. So please, please uh, take a look at that and give us your input on the purchase contract. And I think that's going to do it for today. So thanks, everyone that attended. Arlene, do you have anything to say to wrap it up? Wow, that was awesome. That's our program for today, guys. Please remember to take a minute to do our evaluations that will appear when you sign out of Zoom. We'd love your input and ideas for future programs. I want to thank our panelists, Patrick O'Neill, Laura Lewis, Chuck Garrett, Rhonda Leigh, Lee Hay, and of course, Jason Corta. Mahalo and have a great day. Thank you. Hi. Uh -huh.